Hello. I want to talk a little bit about what it's like using an iPod in 2021. There are a lot of videos out there that talk about this from the perspective of simply using an MP3 player in 2021. Is that worth your time? This video is going to focus more on the iPod itself, some of the problems that I have run into over time, and whether or not it truly is worth it to invest in iPods now over just using Spotify or any other sort of streaming service. Clearly, <laughs> I am a, I'm a, I'm a fan of these devices. I, um, I don't think I'm a collector. I think I'm a little bit more of a hoarder because I don't necessarily want one of every type. I only want the iPods that I think are going to be beneficial to me. For the most part, there are some exceptions, but basically I don't want there to be a part of my near future that is going to be without an iPod. I have been through the ringer with these things before where I break them or they just die and I'm stuck without one and then I have to go back to using my phone and it's just a complete mess. So I have invested in buying a couple of extras for that reason. So these are all of my iPods that currently function. I do have some others that are just kind of for spare parts and they hold other little things that do work just so I have a place to keep them. These are all flash-based players. These four were, of course, hard drive based, but they have all been modded using, I believe all of them are using a board from iFlash. I believe iFlash is just one person, it's a one man show, and they create these flash boards where you can insert SD cards and compact flash cards in order to make the iPods more durable, give them more storage, and improve the battery life, vastly improve all of these things. But, as romantic as this idea is, it is not without its faults. And flash modded iPods are not perfect devices, even though we are vastly improving on their durability and their flexibility, this comes at a cost. The other two players, the Nano and the Shuffle, these players are strictly normal. They're unmodded. In fact, I do not believe that there's much you can do with a Nano or a Shuffle. Maybe little things change out the color, but overall, nanos and shovels are not as, um, I'm not sure what the word is. They're not as beloved, I think, in the legacy community as a classic is, because a classic is just a little bit more flexible. You can do a lot more with it, and there are some really crazy mods you can do. And I would say the same applies to the iPod mini here. So I'm gonna take you through each of these iPods Specifically, I'm going to take you through these. The Nano, um, because it is unmodded and it, it works out of the box essentially, um, there's not too much to talk about right now. We'll get, we'll come to the Nano later. Specifically, I would like us to focus now on essentially these five devices. We have an iPod mini first generation with 64 gigabytes in it an iPod fourth generation standard or classic as they're called today with 128 gigabyte card inside of it, a fifth gen with 256, a sixth gen with 128, and a seventh gen with 256. Most of these kind of have a purpose why I owned them, why I purchased them, and why either I modded them or I had someone else mod them for me. My original daily driver and by original, I mean the one that I, the modded iPod I've been using since I've kind of rediscovered iPods. You know, I think that our gen my generation specifically, you know, the generation that grew up with iPods as teenagers, you know, we really are kind of reliving that nostalgia. And iPods have very much come back into the conversation. So this isn't the first iPod I ever owned. This is the kind of the rebirth iPod, if you will. This is a sixth generation, 128 gigabyte model. I got this for Christmas, I want to say maybe five, six years ago, and it has served me well. However, um, it did come with some problems, <laughs> some little idiosyncrasies. All of these iPods kind of have idiosyncrasies, and you kind of have to learn how to navigate them in order to make them work the best for you. Some of them are related to the iPod itself, and some of them are related to how we use them on a modern computer without having to jump through a lot of hoops. So, the sixth generation modded iPod, it works fine. However, the people who modded this iPod used a rather slow Kingston branded SD card that 
it really slows down the performance of the iPod when you want to sync a large amount of music. I have digitally on in my iTunes slash music app, I have roughly, I think a little under 128. I think I have about 120, 118 gigabyte, gigabytes of music. And once you pass on this guy about the 34 gigabyte mark, it really starts to slow down in terms of its syncing power. And it got to the point where it would corrupt itself because it would take too long to finish reparsing the library. And if I come back to it after 10 minutes and I get frustrated and I might, you know, try to reset it thinking something's wrong with it, well, that's going to corrupt it. So it would corrupt a lot. It wouldn't finish syncing a lot of the time. It wouldn't connect to iTunes properly. So the brand of car that is used in these iPods really makes a difference. And not just the brand, but uh, the, the speed class of the card. So this is a specific problem to this guy. And it's really the only problem that I've had with it. If I could get into it, sixth generation and seventh generation iPod classics are notoriously hard to get into. If I could easily get into this thing, I think I would just replace it. But even with that being said, this iPod is limited to 128 gigabytes. And that is because the sixth generation iPods have a cache limitation that I think can only be exceeded using third party software like Rockbox. So that's the problem I have with the sixth generation. Also, as I said before, I have about 100 and 118 gigabytes. So I was clearly running out of space. And that was when I jumped over to my lovely fifth gen. And I love this iPod. It runs very well. It's been very reliable. That being said, we did have a little bit of a hiccup when I first got him. Um, the issue that I was having with this iPod had to do with an encoder problem. I use a lot of software to procure my music. And when I digitize records and, and, and tapes, the software that I use uses some version of the AAC encoder that this iPod really did not like, and it would cause the iPod to crash. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that is a result of the mod or if that's just a limitation of the fifth generation software, but it was only happening on my fifth gen, so I really don't know why it was doing that. So I had to go back into my lossless copies and I had to re-rip everything. Well, not really re-rip, I just had to transcode it down to a format that the iPod could read. Once I did that, it was fine. The other slight problem with this iPod, and it's not really a functional issue, sometimes after I sync something, it will fail to load the album art library, so everything will just be an empty white box. This is solved with a reset, but it is a little bit annoying. My 7th gen. I jumped to the 7th gen off of the 5th gen as a daily driver for one reason. Um, although I vastly prefer using the 5th gen's interface for its very quick scroll reel and its, I would say, snappier interface, the 7th gen and the 6th gen just come with a lot of features that are a little bit more modern and make the listening experience a lot better, including headphone control support, including... what's another good feature? You can change the shuffle settings directly from the now playing screen, whereas you can't on any other iPod. So I eventually switched back to a 7th gen. This was a birthday present, and this one has 256 gigabytes in there, and it runs very well. But it also has a strange idiosyncratic problem, that being that these days... We're connecting over USB-C adapters, if you're on Mac, which I am. And the problem is, whenever I connect this iPod in particular, and I, and I guess also the 6th gen, although it's been a while since I really synced this guy. The problem is, when you connect it, I think there's a problem with the power, where the power's not quite getting to the iPod fast enough. So what happens is, by the time the iPod officially connects to the Mac, the Mac thinks the iPod is corrupted. It's not and I need to reset it. So what I do now is whenever I want to update my iPod, put songs on, change my playlists, I will reset it manually, and then I will connect it as it is resetting. And this works every single time. This has never failed me. But imagine you're someone who got this kind of as a, I guess, a nostalgic present. You just want to play around with it, and then that happens to you after the first time you sync it, and you think the thing is broken. So... Again, I think this 
relates to the USB-C issue, but I also think it relates to the SD card and how the 7th and 6th gens relate to having an SD card in there and syncing over USB-C. It's just one of those things. The other thing is with 6th and 7th gens, and this isn't really a problem for modded iPods, it's all 6th and 7th generations, the scroll wheel is absolutely terrible. Like, it, sometimes it just doesn't want to work. I do not know what exactly causes this, but it's annoying. And it's a reason why I sometimes prefer to use the 5th gens and the 4th gens, because the quick wheels are so much better. But again, that has nothing to do with the iPod being modded or not. Finally, we come to the 4th gen. And the 4th gen has no problems, to be honest. I have not had a single issue with this guy. Every time I've wanted to reset it or sync it or whatever, it has always... It just takes to whatever I do, like fish and water. Never had a problem with it. Battery's okay, could probably be replaced, but whoever modded this did a very, very good job. It's in very good condition. Not too much to talk about the here. The only thing with this guy is that because it is older, the, you know, the further we get back in time, the fewer features that we have. So it's monochrome screen, which means no album artwork. The, it does not do a great job handling compilations and album artist versus artist tags. So if you have a lot of compilations and you like to kind of keep your iPod library clean, it's going to be a little bit more difficult on a 4th gen than it will be on a 5th, 6th, 7th gen. Same applies to the Mini. This is the recent, my, the most recent addition to my iPod family here. I just modded this one over the last three days. This is the iPod that I recommend to anyone who wants to mod it themselves rather than buying a pre-modded one because I have, I mean, it's taken almost every SD card that I've tried, with a couple exceptions. It's easy to open up. I think you only require one screwdriver, maybe a spudger if you want to be neat about it, and then you just need your updated mod parts. So you need like a, an adapter and an SD card. It's a super easy device to, to work with, and it sounds really good. You know, the older the iPod is, generally the better it will sound, I've found. So it sounds really, really good. And parts for these things are, are pretty ubiquitous. You can I, I bought this guy for 35 euros off of a um, our classified ad, our most popular classified ad website here, and got it within a week. And I used parts from an old mini that I had laying around to kind of bring this one back to life. So it's a bit of a Frankenpod, but it works very, very well. It even came with a little clip. But now we have some other things to talk about, such as just using it with modern computing because it's not just about the iPod itself, it's about how it interacts with the devices around you. So the Nano is the most, it, it's, it's the purest, I think, device I have here because it's not been modded and it works the way it is intended to. If you want to sync an iPod to a modern Mac, so any Mac running anything later than Mojave, so Catalina and Big Sur, I'm not sure if there's one in between, I think it's just Catalina and Big Sur, we all know we they you know Apple got rid of iTunes for Mac users and now we have a separate music app, a podcast app, a videos app, a books app, etc. Now it makes sense for Apple to have done this. They've also put the syncing features for the iPod directly in the Finder, which I think makes sense because it is basically what it was always doing. But <laughs> This new interface is really designed to work more with iPhones, so iOS devices, your iPod Touches, your iPhones, and your iPads. It does sync with iPods, but it's a lot less flexible. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is, for example, my Mac that I use every day, like my daily driver Mac, does not like when I sync multiple iPods to it, as in pre-iPod Touch iPods. I, I think... And I can't be sure why this is, but I think it might have something to do with the fact that the settings just get a little bit jumbled for the computer and it doesn't always remember which device is synced with what. So I've been in, in the predicament before where I've synced multiple iPods. I used one because I just want, I felt like using a fourth gen or a fifth gen that day and I sync it and I plug it in and it will have forgotten what my settings were supposed to be. So I always have my iPod set to do not sync upon connection, wait until I give you the okay. And I do not use manual sync. I do not use drag and drop. So it's always a direct mirror of what I want on the iPod, whether that's through playlists or just the entire library itself. And 
never, ever, ever just open up music or iTunes and start doing what you want. Wait until I click the button and give you the okay. And I do that for a reason that I'll get into later. <laughs> but what would happen is I would plug in my iPod and it would forget all those settings. And it would forget that uh, I didn't want it to manually sync. So I would open it up and then the setting marker would be changed to manual sync, drag and drop. And that would prevent me from actually putting new things on the iPod correctly. It would kind of end up, my, my library would kind of end up being a bit messy. And it happened two or three times and I got so frustrated that what I essentially started doing was only syncing one iPod. And that was my daily driver because this is the one that's probably the most important to me in terms of function. So <laughs> that wasn't great because I have all these other iPods laying around and they were just collecting dust over time. What I started doing was I got my old Mac out, and I'm lucky to say that I even have one. I mean, there's no guarantee anyone else will. And I sync all my other iPods to the other Mac using iTunes, which has no problem syncing multiple iPods to it. So that's something to consider. The shuffle is also in frame right now because the shuffle, although the device works, um, does not work with this paradigm. So if you're on a computer running Catalina or Big Sur, the second gen shuffle will not work. It is a bug that has already been recognized by Apple, but given how niche all of this is, I don't think Apple will ever fix that bug. I'd be very surprised if they did. If you're someone who's used to syncing their phone through their computer, if you're someone who still does that, I do. <laughs> I'm probably a Luddite when I say that, but I do do that you'll notice that the interface is kind of designed for the iPhone. It will give you progress updates on what it is transferring over, the stages of the process that it is in. It will not do this for the iPod. For any older iPods, pre-iPod Touch iPods, it will only show you the amount of storage you have available. And then it will slowly go down as you sync. There is no proper progress bar. There's only like a limitless bar that will tell you that it is processing, kind of like a spinning wheel or, and that's pretty much it. And when it's done, it will stop moving and then you can eject it. It's not very elegant. That's kind of the reality of using an iPod in 2021. The other thing I wanted to quickly talk about is Last.fm. <laughs> so I am a huge fan of Last.fm. I've been using Last.fm for over a decade. And Last.fm is a website for those of you who are not on it, a website that records every song that you listen to and the time that you had, how many times you listened to it, what your favorite albums are, it gives you recommendations for new music, and it used to be, um, let's be real, it used to be a better site than it is now, but I still use it as a kind of music journal. Therefore, I need my players to also be able to Scrabble, and Last.fm eventually took this feature out of their Scrabbler natively, so if you're on a Mac running Catalina or later, or if you're on Windows in general, this feature to sync your iPod to your Last.fm account no longer exists. It used to read the difference in your iTunes library and then sync that change to the website. That's no longer possible. Um, it does work on Mojave. It's a little bit messy, but it does technically still work. But the solution I found for that, so if you do want to scrabble an iPod, is what you do is you could use an app called LastPod, which runs on Java, which means that it is cross-platform. And all you have to do there is make sure your iPod is sent to this is the reason why I said manual sync before, you want to make sure that it is not sent to automatically open iTunes or the music app. And you want to make sure that you have like it, it active as a drive. And then you open up LastPod and you direct it to where your iTunes database file is stored on the iPod. And then before you actually sync the device, so before you open up iTunes or music, you open up LastPod and it will read all of the songs that you've listened to. Um, before, in between your syncs, scrabble them, and then you can open up your music app, your iTunes app, and then it will take those songs and put it into your database. The reason why you cannot do this backwards, so the reason why you cannot open iTunes first and then last pod, is because iTunes or music will strip the database. It will read what's on the iPod, put it in its own database, and then strip the one in the on the iPod. So you have to make last pod your priority if you want to scrabble on, on an iPod. But it is possible, and I have tested it with every single one of these iPods, and I'm happy to say that it works with every single one of them, aside from the Shuffle. <laughs> and I think this is just because the Shuffle does not have the log file on it 
that the other iPods do. That's just my guess, because this is all, you know, log files. I cannot speak to any other iPod that you do not see on this screen, and that's about it. I really hope this video was helpful for for someone out there who's thinking about, you know, is it worth it to get these modded iPods? Every, you know, people are talking about them and they're cool. You can get them from a lot of different places. You can get them on eBay. Uh, you can get them from some resellers that have their own online stores. I got, this is kind of a mix for me. Some of like, uh, this one comes from a person who does this, uh, based in America, who does this. This person I believe is based in Italy. This one I did myself right here in Germany. So, there are uh, a lot of options if you want to get a modded iPod. Just remember that they're going to have idiosyncrasies. They're going to have little weird things about them. One that I didn't mention was that podcast album artwork doesn't show up anymore. That's just a, a thing of the time, I think. Also, contacts and calendar sync. Not that anyone, I believe, would need that these days, but that has gone away. So when Apple removes the feature to uh, to use something and, and, and users can no longer access the feature, the feature is essentially marooned in no man's land. So I guess the final question is, do I actually recommend that you use an iPod today? I would say yes. If you are someone who, I guess who that, that advertisement back from 2001 still works on you, where, you know, you have the stack of CDs and you can turn that into, you can distill all of that into one handheld device. If that is still magic to you and that still works for you and you want to have a curated music library in your pocket, yes. I do recommend going back to the iPod. These modded things are great. The community is amazing. And there's just so much positivity and love coming from that corner of the internet. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it from my end. I really hope that someone found this video useful. If you have any questions about any of these iPods, none of them are for sale. But if you have any questions about my experiences or anything, please let me know, leave a comment below, and I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks for watching. Bye.